In this video, we're going to talk about the LSH Type 7 on NSSA areas on UNOS. Remember that when we want to scale our routing domain on OSPF, we typically break it down into multiple areas. Areas have the advantage of allowing our domain to scale because if we don't do anything just by breaking it into areas, we're suppressing information, we are summarizing some of the complexity, we don't need to have um, the databases also have to be equal between areas. We gain, uh, we lose some information, but we gain some, uh, some the ability to scale our routing domain. We can push that concept even further by having different types of areas, by having areas such as, for example, stop areas. And in stop areas, we're filtering, a net, we're filtering two LSA types. We can filter LSA type four and LSA type five. And if we push it even further, we can filter LSA type threes, type fours, type fives. So, and replace them with, for example, a default route. So we gain, uh, the advantage that we gain there is that the database in that stop area tends to be quite small because we only have the router, the LSA type ones and type twos that belong to links that live inside that area. We don't, we don't have anything from the outside. And that tends to be desirable because that means that the routers in that area doesn't, don't have to be uh, super big because they don't need to do complicated calculations because our database can be smaller. So that's great. But what happens if we need to uh, insert some external routing information in that area? With a stop area type, we can't. Because in that area, we cannot have LSA type 5. And that's the uh, LSA type that we use when we inject external router information. So that's a problem. So to fix that issue, uh, the not so stubby area was created. In a not so stubby area, we have the same characteristics as in a stub area or a stub no summary area if we want, but we are allowing external information to be injected, but we are still suppressing LSA type four and type five. So how, do, how does that happen? Well, it happens by using a new LSA type, the LSA type seven which basically is very, very similar to LSA type five, and it only exists in that particular area. So that's the LSA type we're gonna be talking about in this particular video. We're gonna see it in our topology, we're gonna to do some configuration, we're gonna see the OSPF database and understand it a bit better. Let's look at our topology and I'll explain more what the scenario is. So this is our topology, we have three, area, three areas, we're going to be focusing mostly on area 1 and area 0. Area 1 is an NSSA area, like I said, this will mean, this means that we are filtering 4s and 5s. Um, I will have to check so if it's also an NSSA no summary, but it's really not relevant, it's the same thing. So what's going to happen here? Router 2 is injecting some external routing information. And you know you might run into this case in, on a production environment because you have a partner network or anything of that nature where it just needs to be on that device and you can't connect it to your backbone. So you know, life tends to be stranger than fiction. So um, that might be the case. So we're injecting some uh, external prefixes there and that's being injected as a type seven. Okay, so what happens with that type seven? The type seven, it's only, uh, it only exists in that area. The AVRs will uh, translate that to a type five. But the interesting thing is that it doesn't get translated by all of them. It gets tra translated with, to the one, by the one that has the highest router ID, which in our case, it's probably going to be router three because it has a router ID of all threes. And I think one has a router ID of all ones. So it's probably going to be router three. So router ID, router three will change that, uh, will basically, using the same information that he got from the LSA type seven, will create an, a new LSA type five and send it out to area zero and it's gonna be uh, sent out to the rest of our uh, topology. Because remember that LSA type five are, you know, their scope is the entire routing domain. So this is going to become an LSA type five and it's going to get sent over and it will, you know, it will go to area two and if you have more areas, it will go to those as well. So the other interesting thing is that also since 
on that NSSA area, there's no types 4 and 5. Router 3 will not create an LSA type 4 for this. What's going to happen instead is that instead of relying on the router ID, the forward metric on that LSA type 5 will be one interface that enable you know, SPF on router 2. So router 2 has multiple interfaces that are in OSPF. For example, I think that the forwarding address here will be all twos. So now we, by doing that, we no longer need to um, we no longer need to rely on the LSA type four because the routers in area zero and in area two will know about this network using the summary LSA because that particular network lives on um, its own OSPF. So in area one, the other routers know about it via LSA type one and type twos. That gets translated by the AVRs to an LSA type three, and we have no problem there. That also means that even though only one router is doing that translation, it doesn't mean that all traffic going to that external destination will go through R3. Because remember that when we actually, those LSA type threes will get floated by both of them. So the, it will depend on the lowest metric, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to go through R3. Okay? So let's see this. Let's actually go into the devices and see this. So we'll go into this is R7. We'll go into R2. Let's do show SPF database external. Oh, this is not really not external. This is going to be type 7. So it should be SSA, and these are the different uh, the different external networks that are being injected by router two. So we'll pick this one. We'll pick 172.16.2.0, and just take a look at it uh, from another router, for example, router seven and router six. So let's go to router seven. Let's say, let's do show OSPF database. Remember that in router seven is no longer going to be an, it's no longer going to be a type seven because probably router three, we'll check it now and we'll confirm that it's router three, but probably router three will have done that translation from seven to five. And now we're just gonna get a normal LSA type five. So from the perspective of router seven, he doesn't know that that, that particular LSA comes from an NSSA area. So, Let's do external, extensive, LSA ID, and the ID for that is 172.16.2.0. And we can see it here. And as you can see, we only have one, because like I said, we will only get translated by one AVR. We will have multiple AVRs, which in this case we do. We have here the network, we have here the mask, we have type, type one, we have a metric of 9,000. The forwarding address, which is the address that, uh, like I said, it's, an, it's part of uh, router 2. It's, a, it's an interface that's in uh, OSPF, and we will know about it via uh, LSA's type 3. We'll check it out in a minute. And the tag that it has, and then, you know, normal timers, which in this case, I think that tag is all probably also 9000, and then uh, normal timers. So what's going to happen here is that... We now know that if we want to reach that destination, we need to um, figure out how we send traffic to uh, that forwarding address. So we can search for that forwarding address via, um, we could search it via using LSA step one and using LSA step two, or we can search for it. We will not find it because we're not in the same area, but we could also search for them using LSA step three. So let's search using LSA step three. We can say net summary, we can say extensive, we can say LSA ID, and we can say 2.2.2.0, because I think that's a slash 24. And we can specify only area zero, because this device also lives in area two, so might, we might get more output from area two, which is not really going to be that, really that helpful. So, <clears throat> you see now we're getting that we can reach the network by sending traffic to 
router one, we can reach the network by sending traffic to router three. And it's now in a matter of, and we can say what we have a metric here of two, the network, the mask, the network, the mask. And now it's a matter of determining, um, so you can see how it all adds up. So now it's a matter of determining, okay, so I just need to add all those costs up. I need to add the cost of that LSA type five. So, you know, I need to add the cost of the five plus the cost of the three plus whatever cost I have of reaching the ABR. And whatever is um, the smallest is the, the my preferred route. So if I go and I do, let's check if I do show routes, probably be a router one. We have that our total cost here is going to be 9,003 and we're sending this traffic over uh, router one. So 17.1 is going to be the destination that we're going to be using for the destination that we're going to be using to send this over to the network. So next we can check, we'll have the same thing on router six. We'll check what preference router six is gonna have, but this probably should have given you a good idea of how this actually works. So let's check R6. We open R6. We can do show route. No, that's not the number. The number is one seventy two sixteen zero two dot zero, and we get that here. The preferred way is going over router three. And this is a preferred way because, like I said, we are adding all those costs up and making the using the shortest path to that particular destination because the metric here is one, the metric here is one, and I think the metric here is also one, one. The metric between R7 and R6 is gigantic, it's 15,000 because that's one link we only want to be used as last resort. So, like I said, what they are doing there is from router seven, he's, you know, obviously seeing what the cost of the LSA 5 is and adding that to the cost of the uh, LSA 3 for the forwarding address and adding it to the cost of reaching both AVRs. And obviously in the case of, um, in the case of router, uh, in the case of router seven, the preferred path is to go via router one. And in the case of router six, the preferred path is to go over uh, router three. And kind of to sum it up, this is basically what we would expect to see with an LSA type seven. Remember that the interesting thing is we have this requirement where we need an area where we are filtering LSA type four and five, and even LSA three, fours and fives. But for some reason, like I said in the beginning, maybe we have a partner network or maybe we have an external uh, one connection or anything like that where we need, to re we need to inject external routing information into our domain, which in this case, in our example here was router two, but that's not available for one of our backbone routers. So, you know, what do we do? Well, we can convert that area to NSSA. And after we convert that area to NSSA, we can actually have that. But in order to continue filtering LSAs fours and fives, a new LSA type is introduced that's only uh, significant or, or use in that area, later it gets translated by uh, the AVR with the highest router ID to normal five. We are no longer using LSA type four because now we are just using the forwarding, the forwarding metric, the forwarding address to an interface of the router that's injecting that external routing information. And we know about that via the normal LSA type threes. So, the com as you can see here, <clears throat> reading the actual da database is not that complicated. It's more about understanding how all the pieces work together. And we do have a theory video that speaks a little more into detail about this. But the idea here was to see it on the Junos here with the Junos command, see it with the database in the format that Junos utilizes. So you had uh, some exposure to this. I hope this information has been useful. Thank you for watching.